Joining me now is the former Australian Medical Association president and former MP for Wentworth, Karen Phelps. Thank you for your time, Professor. How worrying is it, do you think, that the Victorian Health Department is turning people away for testing if they don't have symptoms, even if they've been in close contact uh, with an infected person? Hello, Sherry. Well, it really should be just a matter of course that per people who are close contacts of a confirmed case of coronavirus are tested, whether they have symptoms or not. And so it's extremely important that people do present themselves for testing. We have a really precious window of opportunity, particularly with this crossroads uh, outbreak in New South Wales, to make sure that we test and trace as many people as we possibly can to identify any cases that are in the community. I think there might have been some cross, cross wires down in Victoria because it seems that the, uh, the message has become confused. I mean, what uh, the, the message is, is to get tested if you are a close contact of somebody with coronavirus, and yet it appears that some people have been turned away from testing. Uh, I think it's important that we try and find out how that might have happened, uh, why that message uh, was mixed up. But certainly, if you have a look at the protocols from the Victorian uh, Department of Health, it would indicate that, that under a, an order uh, that asymptomatic people can be tested and indeed should be tested in, a, in an outbreak. We now know that the outbreak in Victoria has actually spread to New South Wales. It's responsible for the spread to New South Wales. Do you think the New South Wales Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, should have shut New South Wales borders to Victoria earlier than when she did? I was very, very worried when we saw the uh, Victorian school holidays coming up and we had an, an, a confirmed outbreak in Victoria and, uh, and there was a plan for many people to be coming from Victoria up to New South Wales for the school holidays and the borders remained open. And I was thinking around about the end of June would have been the right time to close the borders so that we could contain the outbreak to Victoria and not having it coming through and infecting people in New South Wales. Uh, that didn't happen until the 9th, uh, of, uh, the 9th of July. And so uh, that, that really, I think, was a missed opportunity. Uh, it's, it's very easy to say these things in retrospect and a lot of uh, factors go into the decisions that are made by, by premiers and health officers about when to do things like close borders. And of course, there are complex issues around border towns like Albury, Wodonga. Uh, but that being said, I think containment of the outbreak was probably the most important thing we could have done at that stage and closing the borders and also stopping people from just flying in from Melbourne into Sydney or Victoria into, into New South Wales at that time. Uh, catching trains and coming in without being checked uh, for coronavirus, uh, that also should have been addressed at an earlier stage. I mean, moving forward from here, do you expect that the states will now go in and out of lockdown? Uh, and should Australia should have, you know, should we have considered pursuing an elimination rather than a suppression strategy to avoid exactly this? Well, look, we're hearing a lot of semantics around suppression versus elimination. The ideal is that we have no cases in the community in Australia in any state or territory. And so we should be aiming for that. Now, uh, if that means that we are doing that through uh, all of the things that we know we need to do, identifying cases, contact tracing, quarantining of cases, making sure that we have widespread testing, the, the, the hygiene measures that we've been talking about, like hand washing and cough etiquette and physical distancing, the real missing piece of the puzzle here has been about mask wearing, because we know that that is a very important, crucial element to reducing transmission in the community. So we have to do everything we possibly can. Now, if that means that we are going to go for zero for elimination of the virus from all states and territories in Australia, then I think that's what we should be going for. We almost got there in New South Wales. We did have zero for a while. Victoria almost got there. New Zealand has achieved elimination. Uh, if, if we're talking suppression really as a political strategy, that's a whole different thing to, to talking about it as an epidemiological or as a health strategy. Obviously, from the health point of view, we are talking about an extremely dangerous virus, one that in some people is mild, but we need to take this very seriously. And one of the problems is that with the messaging around coronavirus, a lot of people are hearing only the part about it being mild. They're not hearing the part about this could affect your health for your entire life. It could mean uh, infection that affects your brain, your heart, your lungs, other parts of your body, your kidneys. And so people are hearing this message about, well, you know, it's, it's a virus, a lot of people get over it, 
they're not hearing about the serious implications it has for so many people. And so they're not necessarily taking it seriously. When we talk about physical distancing, wearing a mask where you can't physical distance, where you're in a lift, for example, if you're in public transport, or if you're in crowded places, avoiding things like parties and crowded pubs. These are the messages we need to get through to people, not just to save lives of each other, but also to be able to save the economy. These are the serious messages people need to pay attention to. Just to pick up on a point you've just made there about mask wearing, the United States President Donald Trump stepped out wearing a mask for the first time just, just under a week ago. And our health minister here, Greg Hunt, has started to speak uh, more frequently about wearing a mask and, and even put one on at a press conference. Let's have a, a quick look at that. Again, though, I would... Uh encourage Victorians uh, where you cannot social distance and uh, you are in proximity to other people to please wear a mask. One, and two. Thank you very much. I think the fact that he struggled to put one on perhaps shows that he's not wearing it throughout the day. Do you think our politicians have been too slow to take up mask wearing and set an example? Well, let me say that I was so pleased to see Greg Hunt doing that particular press conference and putting on a mask. I don't care that he didn't get it perfectly right the first time because sometimes you do slip with putting a mask on. I wear one every day that I'm in the clinic and, uh, and sometimes you don't get it perfectly right the first time every time. And, and I think what we need to do is to be uh, getting this message across and I, and I was pleased to see that the health minister gave this message. There was another message today from, from Michael Kidd, the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, saying that masks should be worn in, uh, in the Greater Melbourne area, in areas where there are outbreaks by all healthcare workers. Uh, the Royal Australian College of Physicians was saying that, uh, that they think all healthcare workers should be wearing masks while at work. Uh, I believe that we, anybody who is in an, in an area where they are likely to be in contact with other people. You don't know if somebody nearby to you, if somebody that you are in a lift with, for example, is somebody who's in a, in a bus nearby to you, if somebody even who uh, is close to, close to you in, in a supermarket is an asymptomatic carrier of the virus and you could catch the virus from that person just breathing on you, talking near you, sneezing, coughing. And uh, it, it really doesn't matter how many times you wash your hands, if you're not wearing a mask, that person can infect you. And so it's really important that we get this message across about masks. Now, the CDC came on board with this uh, a long time ago, now weeks and weeks ago, and they said that wearing cloth masks in public will protect the person who wears the mask and it will protect other people if you are infected. So it works both ways. Uh, there are now some patterns that are available out there where you can do, do your own mask. And I think that that is, uh, is something that will save cost and also be environmentally uh, friendly so that we're not looking at masks all going into landfill. We definitely need to have surgical masks and the respirator type masks in people in the healthcare sector and particularly uh, the, uh, the higher performing masks for people who are working or likely to be working in close contact with people with coronavirus. But everyone in the community needs to be getting this message about masks. If you want to stay in work, if you want your favourite stores to be open, if you want restaurants to be able to remain open, get a mask, wear, wear, get several masks so that you can actually have, wash the washable, reusable ones, uh, have a supply of masks uh, in some way so that you can wear masks in these particular circumstances. And the most important ones, as I said, are going to be in places where you can't physically distance, in crowded streets, in lifts, in workplaces where you can't physically distance. I noticed that, uh, that retail workers in, in many of the places I'm visiting now are wearing masks in public transport. These are all the places where it's so important. And of course, uh, with the Royal Australasian College of Physicians recommendation just this week uh, of all healthcare workers wearing masks in healthcare settings. Karen, just very quickly before you go, because we're almost out of time, Australians are still being encouraged to download the COVID Safe app uh, even though it has failed to prevent or even slow the outbreak in Victoria and New South Wales. Do you think it, it has been a failure? Well, so far, it certainly has not been a success. And uh, the thing about the COVID Safe app is that it, it sort of over, over promised. We really needed to have uh, as many Australians as possible downloading this, but also the, the app itself failed. Uh, because it didn't work with particular types of phones when they were locked, which they are most of the time. 
Uh, a lot of people also had privacy concerns after the My Health Record situation. They were worried about what the government might do with their data. And, uh, and so that there, there was that particular concern. And, you know, it's really not a lot of point having uh, contact tracing that relies on an app on a phone that doesn't work when the phone's locked or if the majority of people don't have it on the phone so that they can be alerted. Uh, the other thing is that, you know, we were being told that you should download the app so that it would keep you safe. Well, if you've already been in contact with somebody, then you're not going to be safe. It will alert you and, and you can get tested and you can wait and find out if you have been infected. And so the messaging around the reason for this app really should have been around public interest rather than personal safety. Uh, so, you know, it hasn't been a success. Uh, that's not to say it won't be if they sort out all the bugs in the system. Uh, but for the moment, I think we have to pay great tribute to the people who are working very long hours and putting everything they have into the contact tracing, into the testing, into the care of people who have COVID-19 and to the people who are who are trying to get rid of this infection from Australia, the, the healthcare workers, uh, the emergency services workers, uh, the polit politicians, health advisors in Victoria and New South Wales, who I know are working so hard to try and make sure that Australia does uh, suppress and hopefully eradicate coronavirus from, from Australia. And then of course, we have to maintain border control. That's a really essential part of this whole picture as well. We have to maintain the quarantining. We have to make sure that uh, that before people leave quarantine, that they are not infectious. At the moment, there isn't an exit test for people leaving quarantining. Uh, if they have a, 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 a positive test even while they're in quarantine. As long as they're asymptomatic for 72 hours, off you go without having to have a negative test. So I think that is something that also has to be uh, addressed as well and I think the evidence needs to be reviewed on that one. Yeah, Professor Karen Phelps, thank you very much for your time and expertise as former Australian Medical Association President. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry.